Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the bullpen. All right, in the bullpen today, we have Christian Daytok, White House correspondent, Washington Examiner. How are you, sir? Dr. Ritchie, I'm great, thanks for having me on. Well, thanks for being on the show, glad to have you on the program. We're gonna chop it up about Democratic leadership and did progressive progressives compromise, did the left compromise on this bill too much? Um, I don't want to presume what you know or believe about that sentiment. So I will give you the opportunity to share with us how you feel. Well, I appreciate that. And I think the important word here is in fact compromise. Uh, obviously progressives did not get either the top line figure that they originally wanted, nor the top line figure that the White House put forward during that second round of negotiations. But they're on a clock here, one that's both imposed by congressional leadership, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer, in terms of bringing these two dual infrastructure bills to the floor for a vote in tandem. And then also, they're on the clock in terms of passing meaningful legislation before the Senate and the House sort of winds down heading into the 2022 midterm elections. The reality of the situation is simply that Joe Manchin, Kirsten Cinema, and of course the entire Republican Party would never ever vote for a $3.5 trillion social welfare safety net, whatever you want to call it package, let alone a $6 trillion or a $10 trillion package. I think a compromise is the optimal word. Neither side necessarily got what they wanted, but at the end of the day, there is a significantly larger tranche of money, twice the size of the new deal back passed in the Franklin Delano Roosevelt administration, the largest social spending package in the history of the United States that Democrats can bring to the table heading into the 2022 midterm elections. I think you're kind of comparing <clears throat> apples and oranges. Because when you look at what the spending bill covered decades ago, it's not the same coverage today. So for example, HBCUs were not part of the conversation in the same way decades ago as they are today. Remember, HBCUs went from over 40 billion in the conversation. Biden said 90 billion for HBCUs and minority serving institutions to getting a handful of dollars comparatively speaking, okay? So that's a problem. And I understand your point of view and I get it because I have many of my friends who are more corporate Democrats and they kind of align with the compromise agenda. But I wanna remind you of something. Because the words of this very wise man echo strong today. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, and I quote, this is no time to engage in a luxury of cooling off or to take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. Now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. Right now, we have 94 self-proclaimed progressives in Congress, 96, you count the Senate, the senator won and you count the delegate that doesn't have real voting power. One third of them are lying about being progressives, okay? They caucus with them, but they lie, all right? And then you have the core, you got real progressives there. They were elected and they beat many of them corporate Democrats. Why? Because their district said, we want this bold, fresh new leadership that comes in with an agenda, progressive agenda, rather than the compromise of old. So I get what you're saying, but think about it this way, brother. The game of politics is not a game of checkers, it's a game of chess. In checkers, you use power to get position. In chess, you use position to get power. Which also means that sometimes you have to strategize to allow a piece to be taken off the board in order for you to have a better position to trap their king. That's how this works. I think too many times we are playing the game of action and reaction rather than a game of strategy and willing to go through a negative political cycle. Willing to let them go all the way through with their plans because we're not moving with ours. Now here's what would have happened, this is what I believe. If progressives would have held on to the original agenda, hell if Biden would have held on to his original agenda. Remember, he's the one that compromised progressives were trying to get the bill closer to what he wanted initially, right? So they're trying to hold him to the accountability factor of his own proposal. You make people believe in you. You make people believe in you. We're, we're not excited about Biden. We're not excited about Harris anymore. Good luck in the midterm elections. Good luck in the presidential cycle. 
People came out of record numbers because they were excited due to a policy agenda, a, a shift in the country's policy narrative. But you, you're not delivering that. HBCUs can't get on board with this. Um, you can't get on board when you don't stand up for American workers, equal pay for equal work. Come on, man, I, I get what you're saying, but the compromise is significant here. It's not a small compromise. It's certainly significant and there's a couple of points that I do want to touch on that you made. And I, I agree with what you're saying by and large. And I think this is sort of a problem that's plaguing both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. When you have members who are more versed or cut their teeth on the activism side rather mm -hmm. than the politics side. You get into government and you start recognizing I'm not going to be able to get my agenda through exactly how I want it necessarily because of the way the body is made up in which I have to operate. You said roughly one third of the Congress claims to be progressive. That means there's still two thirds of the Congress who a either are more moderate centrist or are outright conservative. I mean, it's very hard to get those people to come across your line of thought. I do want to talk about the HBCU funding issue, which I agree that is a significantly smaller sum than was proposed by President Biden or obviously proposed by the black activists who called for this to be included in the reconciliation project. Um, there is a larger issue that according to uh, the activists who I've spoken to and just sort of the, the national conversation, not to mention many of the, the reporters in the room at the White House, voting rights and police reform are two equally important issues, which again are not addressed in the reconciliation budget package. And they certainly won't be addressed unless Democrats can bring something to the table to show, look, yes, the country is divided. Yes, Republicans technically hold the same amount of votes as we do in the Senate, although we have a slight majority with the vice president casting the tie breaking vote. But we were able to deliver this on the clock with a significant crunch while still dealing with coronavirus. Now either we can hold on to our majorities in the midterm elections or even potentially pull some moderate Republicans over to address voting rights, to address police reform, to address the host of other issues which aren't contained in this spending package. And I think again, just circling back on what you were talking about before, this is sort of the problem with politics in general right now. We have a tribalist mentality. We have two sides of the aisle which are about as far apart as you can be ideologically as they ever have been in modern politics. And until the elected officials begin to match the voterate, especially the young people, Gen Z, millennials, the uber progressive or even the sort of you know, pro worker right and find common ground, it's going to be hard to find any compromise. So again, that's why I think it was smart to compromise, take what you can now and try to come back to the table later, win the game down the line. I understand where you're coming from. This is almost again, apples and oranges, two totally opposite sides of the same coin. The unfortunate reality is progressives did not receive a good faith acknowledgement that these things will be tackled quickly. That's another problem with this entire bill. I get the pragmatic elements of it, okay? I'm a pragmatic man. I just don't think progressive ideologies are non-practical. I think they are very practical when applied properly. Now I want to remind you, top three items. Number one, voting rights. And that was partly because of what Republicans did by way of Donald Trump to start to degrade um, policies in states that went after voter access, right? So voting rights shot to the top of the Democratic list of what's important. You got nothing on voting rights. And then policing accountability, you got zero on qualified immunity, or anything else. You got zero on the George Floyd Policing and Accountability Act, you got nothing. Here's the other great irony of this, HBCUs, and I bring, that, I bring this up for a particular reason. Vice President Kamala Harris has a whole damn degree from an HBCU. I have a degree from an HBCU, okay? No way in the hell would I have allowed this to happen if I was a vice president of a whole country and I understand the dynamic force of HBCUs. HBCUs, they're not just connected to the person that goes there. Somebody in the black community touches a graduate of an HBCU on a daily basis. That's how powerful HBCUs are, okay? For 
HBCU students, for graduates, for the alum, for individuals who are connected to fraternities and sororities, who made those phone calls, who sent those text messages, who held those yard signs, who went door knocking, who did all of that volunteerism for the Biden-Harris ticket. Do you think they're gonna come back out and do it again? Their excitement was infectious, brother. My point is, we get the political compromise, but I think they've compromised too much, especially when you look at them trying to excite the base again to vote in record numbers. The best thing that could happen to Biden is if Trump runs for president again. Because right now, the only person that can excite Democrats to vote is Donald Trump. That's it. Because nobody is excited about what's happening right now. You know, on that note about Vice President Harris being or needing to be involved in these negotiations, needing to come to bat for HBCUs, I do agree with you. And I was actually at a meeting with the VP and the Divine Nine officials Mm -hmm. over at her executive office, um, uh, ceremonial office, excuse me, in the executive office building over at the White House about a month ago. And they said exactly what you had said. This is not just about funding, this is about voting rights. All of these issues are intertwined. And I do think the administration has put Vice President Harris in a difficult spot, being that she can't just solely focus on on a small number of issues like vice presidents traditionally do. She's also been saddled with immigration. She's also been saddled with trying to relaunch NASA and reinvigorate support for our manned flight programs. That being said, I think this is sort of a problem that, and it's strange because Donald Trump tapped into this in 2016. He earned record number, albeit very small number of, or excuse me, a number of black votes for a Republican candidate. He in 2020 earned a record number of Latino votes for a Republican candidate. That being said, I'm not really sure there are many policies that President Trump brought to the table that specifically helped the black community, that specifically helped the Latino community. I think this is a problem with politicians in general on both sides of the aisle. You say what you need to say to campaign, to gin up support among certain voting demographics, certain voting blocks, and then once you're in office, you assume these people will vote for me whenever, no matter what. So I don't need to make good on those promises. Mm, and in yeah. that regard, I agree with you totally. This yeah. is a major failing of both parties. The Biden administration, whether there's a new administration in 2024, everyone has the cards in their hand to make a change. And this is a major problem in politics at this point in time. We make promises on the campaign trail that aren't fulfilled once these politicians enter office. Christian, you make some great points and you are, we are thankful that a person like you is in the position you're in. Uh, Let me say this, Um, a lot of black people that voted for Donald Trump, voted for Donald Trump as a protest vote against the Democratic Party. Even if they did not articulate it just as that, this was a case uh, that Trump made to black Americans um, about the Democratic Party. And so you have this protest vote element connected to the Trump support. Also. Politics is 100% transactional, it's a transactional sport. You literally are not voting for a person, you're voting for a policy. And so when you vote for that policy, you're not looking at process, you're looking at outcome. When the voter goes back to vote, they're not going to say, well, I wonder what process happened with this item, what process happened with that one. What they're voting for is what the outcome was, right? So if you have a transactional system, Well, routinely, people are voting for you because you make promises to engage in that transaction to deliver the policy that you said you would deliver. And you continue time after time again to not deliver on that policy. We can call it compromise, that's fine. But I go back to the words of Dr. King. This is gradualism and gradualism is tranquilizing. And that is what has started to happen, in my opinion, to many progressives right now in Congress. Now, the vote is done. I'm not going to harp on it. They are still better than most as far as policy is concerned, in my opinion, and we have to move forward. But I do have significant concern about Democrats being able to hold on to congressional seats throughout this country if there's not a big delivery of what was voted on two years ago. I think you're probably right. There is one thing that Democrats have in their corner though, although traditionally the in power party does lose majorities in the midterm election. 
And that's the Senate math itself. Republicans have, I wanna say 20 seats that they have to defend in 2022. Democrats have around 12 to 14, I forget the exact numbers off the top of my head. If they can bring this massive generational spending package around to the campaigns in Florida, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, all of these states, which could not only hold on to their majority, but perhaps even possibly expand it, that's going to be extremely important. You're going to always have this element in the House where compromise is more reasonable, it's more realistic. The Senate is really, again, dating back to the Obama administration, where policy has gone to die. And if your goal as a progressive lawmaker activist is to enact new policy, that's where you actually have to pick up votes and maintain your legislative majority. Again, if you're only trying to obstruct, you don't necessarily even have to get anything done. You can just hold up the process and even if you wait out the clock, that's a win in your book. So I do think there is a danger, again, specifically because progressives haven't guaranteed a vote. They have the soft deadline of a November 15th to bring that bill, the BBB better Build Back Better Reconciliation Bill to a vote in the House. But there's no guarantee that's going to happen. The moderates have said, we gotta have the Congressional Budgetary Office score before that's done. This thing has to be made clear that it's going to be paid for by itself. And there is a good chance that this once it gets to the Senate, that they lop off the entire paid family leave section, which again has been whittled down from President yep. Biden's original proposal. That being said, and I think this is where we genuinely disagree, a stepping stone in my view is better than not moving forward at all, if that is your goal. We'll see how this thing plays out, but I'm feeling pretty confident that Democrats will feel good heading into the holidays once this thing is all said and done. All right, we'll see, man, I disagree. I think they're playing checkers and not chess. I think they lose the long game. They may win some short term favor. They're gonna try to spin it, create messaging around it. But come election day, people are gonna say, what have you done for me lately? All right, thank you, brother, always, man. I really like your stuff and thank you for coming on the show. Anytime, Dr. Richie, I appreciate it. Absolutely.